Well, good evening. It's very nice for all of you. We've got a really good turnout today. Excellent. I'm so pleased. Uh, welcome to another Macula Society virtual clinic. Um, obviously, we, we, we set these up as part of um, our COVID response, um, but now they're just a thing that we do uh, every, uh, every month. The uh, last Thursday of the month, we have a little conversation uh, with a leading uh, clinician or researcher into specific conditions um, that is not age-related macular degeneration. Uh, if you're interested in that, there is another, another stream uh, uh, on the third Tuesday of the month, um, related macular degeneration. Um, but I'm very happy for you all to be here. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin Daniels, and I'm the Working Age and Young People Service Manager for the Macular Society. Uh, and uh, I, I sort of support people who are just a little bit younger. Um, we say working age, but that's a sort of a, 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 an open sort of atmosphere of, of, uh, of, of, of the, the oldest person I supported who was still working was 82. So, you know, you choose anyway. Let's go through a bit of uh, housekeeping as we always have to do with these kind of things. Um, we we uh, I really ask really politely if you, uh, if you mute um, and, and leave the videos off and try not to press any buttons because occasionally we do have the occasional shared screen pop up, um, which uh, is a bit awkward. So, uh, so, so if you can just sort of try not, fantastic. Uh, so we're here today uh, to talk about um, the forgotten uh, with uh, Professor Peter Kofi from UCL, uh, which we, we, we'll um, in, introduce him in a wee second. Now, a few people have sent some questions in for, for the professor, uh, but the chat function is open. So while uh, Pete is doing his uh, a presentation of, in a few minutes, you're more than happy, welcome to just put some in the, in, the, uh, in the chat, any questions you may have, and we really encourage that. Um, we've got a couple of other people on the call, uh, who are sort of on, on our So the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Jerry Hode, who's the Macular Society Research Manager, who um, is, well, we should just say hello and introduce Jerry. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm the Research Manager. So I look after all the research projects that the Macular Society funds. It's a very important part of what we do, as well as our services um, and support for people with macular degeneration. Um, we spend about one and a half million pounds a year on research. That, that's how important to us. And we're currently funding about 20 projects. Um, some of those involve stem cells, some of those involve gene therapy. Um, and obviously they cover all, and all, lots of dystrophies and lots of projects on AMD. Um, we don't have any on myopic macular degeneration, but it's something I want to change in the near future. But I'm looking forward to hearing what Pete has to say tonight. Perfect. Brilliant. Well, that's that's. Thank you for for having me along. So, anyone's got any questions for Jerry as well? Just pop them in the chat, and we can perhaps chat with her as well a bit later on. The next person I want to introduce before we get to our, uh, before we get to be is is Heloise Law, and um, she is a patient with um, a myopic macular degeneration, um, and um, she she was one of the reasons that so we were able to to set this meeting up. So she's. She's going to deal with all the chats and the questions that you guys might want to ask later on. So, uh, hi, hi, Heloise, how are you? On me, on you. So perhaps on unmuting you, on you. might might help. A bit of a bit of a rookie error there. Um, hello, everyone. Very pleased to be here. Um, yes, I'm going to be asking um, uh, Professor Coffey the questions. We've had lots of interesting uh, queries already, and I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, what else gets put in the chat during the course of the event. Thanks very much. Well, you're more than welcome. And finally, uh, there, there is, uh, well, I say finally, I, I have to mention that if there is a, a round, you might hear a sort of a, a, a from, from, from the ether, and that is my support worker patient who helps me run these things, otherwise it might all go a bit deep long. So uh, if, uh, if you hear a, a voice um, that, that I haven't introduced, Patients, and that's who she is. Uh, and so, and finally, uh, it's, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Pete Kofi, uh, who we all know from UCL and all the fantastic work that he's been doing into stem cells. Um, 
And uh, I'm just going to sort of hand over to you, really, Pete, because I'm sure you know a lot yourself a lot better than I do. So uh, it's, good to, <laughs> it's good to see you, and thank you for taking the time this evening to come and talk to us all. Uh, Colin, yeah, I definitely know myself, especially over this last year's locking, that's for sure. You get to know yourself better. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure again uh, to be talking with the Macula Society. Um, what I want to do today is actually discuss myopia because of an interest I've had within this area because of the um, adult later stages of the disease, which I think tend to uh, lend itself to therapies which the London Project has been developing for the age-related form of macular degeneration. So I know there was um, a recent um, discussion with Professor Guggenheim from Cardiff. So I'm just gonna briefly go over some of the uh, components of myopia, but then to get to uh, the reason why I think uh, regenerative medicine may have a place and a therapeutic towards um, the later stages of uh, myopia. So as I say, I'm gonna go quickly through these. The problem with myopia is this problem around the ability to focus the outside world on the retina. And our normal way in terms of a normal eye and a normal lens focuses it back into the macular region where we focus the outside world. In the case of myopia, there is an excessive growth. And I'm not going to go into all the reasons as to why that happens. This is something which uh, Professor Guggenheim did discuss. But basically, the problem being there's an excessive growth, which is considered to uh, develop at a young age. And it may be due to uh, the involvement in terms of the amount of close work which is done in childhood. Uh, the amount of light, um, whether it be outside or inside, uh, but it's the development and the over uh, excessive size of the eye leading to this, what's known as high myopia, whereby um, the outside world can't be focused easily in terms of the um, lens and the rest of the structures within the eye. <laughs> now, I'm going to go towards that pathologic myopia, but I'm just going to lead leaders up to that event. So the problem with that oversize, and in this top, you see a normal eye, and in B, in the right or in the middle, you actually see um, a myopic eye. Oh, sorry. Oh, I thought that was you calling me, Colin. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in, in the B, you can see that there's a difference in size. And then on the right, it's just a drawing. The right shows you, uh, the blue shows you the normal eye size. And the red shows you the excessive growth in a myopic eye. But amazingly, that overgrowth has impact both in terms of the actual image that you're trying to focus it has a problem in terms of just a general biology in the back of the eye and the biology of the back of the eye. Also in the support of the various components that are needed to keep that eye functioning uh, correctly. And also in the blood supply at the back of the eye and effectively the globe which, in, which holds the whole of the eye, which is the sclera at the back. So even though this is a developmental issue and it's only a size issue, it has a major impact on nearly every component and biological component of the eye. Now, my interest in this is obviously, as with my reasons for age-related macular degeneration, is just the sheer number and population of people. And here I'm just showing you that population in terms of high myopia. And this is um, 
people between the ages of 18 and 40 and the percentage that fall into this group um, as a percentage of their population. So while Denmark is quite small, as the further you go east, then that increase becomes very significant. And some numbers now that are coming out in terms of 20 year olds even within the Asian continent, nearly 95% are not high myopic, but they're definitely uh, myopic. So this whole problem there in terms of the size and the population, and in fact, the actual growth in that population, clinical population, and definitely into the near future. So um, the major thing which, um, or the major component to which uh, Professor Guggenheim um, addressed was once there's a clear indication of the onset of myopia, can you then in some way delay or suppress or slow down? And again, I'm not gonna go into this because this is more towards um, you know, young adults, children, is the ways of actually affecting the progression and the speed of that. And there is, there are ways in which this has been uh, addressed in terms of glasses, in terms of the use of atropine, et cetera. But I'm not gonna discuss any of that tonight. One of the things undoubtedly, or one of the questions which I am preempting, as in I would have thought someone would ask is, well, what about gene therapy? Well, gene therapy is great if it is basically one gene which seems to be the fault and the cause of whatever the disease is. There's been a few studies now here in London at Moorfields Eye Charity in California, 23andMe in genetics has been involved in this. And if you try and identify what genes appear to be associated with myopia, both in the development, the progression, and the various uh, stages, then it's absolutely not one gene. There's a whole list of genes. And in fact, there's not a single component or part of the eye and its genetic material, which does not appear to be involved in myopia. And that's not surprising because it is a developmental issue. There are so many genes involved in the different ways different cells develop, and all of those appear to be uh, in, impacted uh, in myopia in terms of that um, uh, development. So would genetic or gene therapy be possible? No, not really. Um, there is some indication that in high myopia and in certain families, there may be certain genes which are more uh, expressed in higher myopes and higher myopes families. But again, that doesn't preclude the fact that there is a whole gamut of genes which appear to be involved and affected. So, Gene therapy, which will target and typically targets just one gene or a very, very small class of genes, is not a very good target for myopia. So what I want to come to tonight is developmental wise, you may be able to stop the progression. There may be possibilities there in terms of using uh, various um, aspects in terms of lenses, in terms of LASIK, in terms of um, atrophy to slow the development of myopia. But what happens if you actually go to that high myopic stage and um, you are effectively going into a pathological component? And this uh, picture just from top A, to bottom me um, gives you an indication of an eye which is starting to show some very significant deteriorations and cell death. And probably D is the easiest one for, for us to, to highlight that. 
in which you see the red picture, which has a normal retinal appearance, and then you see these white areas, and that white area is over the macular region. And that's clearly where cells have died and where there's been a major um, problem in terms of uh, the size of the eye and biomechanical stress just due to that um, shape of the eye. So at this point, and sadly in this individual in D, they would have clearly lost a substantial amount of useful vision, if not from this picture, probably all. So the question is, how prevalent is uh, this type of myopic macular degeneration? And in low myopes, it's very small. It's about 8% of the population of, high, of low myopes. In high myopes, it's about 29%, 30 to 29% in the high myopes. But what is staggering is when you actually put those numbers into the number of people who are now suffering from um, myopia. And without doubt, within a very short period between 2030 and 2050, there could be almost a billion people suffering myopic macular degeneration, which is way bigger than the number will be suffering from age-related macular degeneration. So why is it that I'm talking to you? And it's because the therapy we've been developing for the London project, which people uh, may or may not know, has been my major uh, target, um, lends itself to uh, myopic degeneration. And I just want to give you an indication of why, and then tell you about some of the work which we're doing now. So just to go back a step, I mean, the beauty of the eye is obviously we can look through it and that red reflection gives a picture of the back of the eye. And those pictures now can be commonly taken uh, even at your, your opticians. And what we're talking about in macular um, degeneration is an area. The macula is not in itself a disease. It's a, it's a geographic location in the back of your eye. And basically it's a circle, roughly a circle about 10 millimeters, which also includes the major focal area where you focus the world uh, called the fovea, which is about a millimeter. So it's this area, both in age-related macular degeneration and in myopia, in which if there is any disturbance or degeneration here, then your fine detail, your ability to read, your ability to recognize faces, etc., will be compromised. So that picture doesn't really do justice. If you think of the back of the eye almost as layers of an onion, you've got three layers. You've got the top part, which contains all the cells that are sensitive to light. You've got, which is called the neural retina. You've then got a middle layer, and that's called RPE. The, the name is retinal pigment epithelium, but I'm not gonna test anyone. Uh, let's just call it the RPE. Um, but it's crucial to keeping that top part, the retina, healthy. And then you have a massive blood supply behind it, which gives nutrients to the RPE for it then to give it to the retina. And then behind the choroid, you then have a cup in which the eye is contained called the sclera. And in um, myopia, in the early stages, the major problem, sorry, the major problem is because of that mechanical stress, the size of the eye is bigger than would normally be. There's me mechanical stress on those cells, on that sheet of cells, the blood supply, the choroid, and the RPE. And that starts to cause a breakdown in the vessels, a breakdown in that middle layer, because that middle layer is 
it's almost like a, a, a fence. It's a barrier to the outside world for, for many reasons, but I'm not going to go into those today. But those two layers, the choroid and the RPE start to deteriorate. And as some of you know, that deterioration initially can lead to bleeds as well. Now, this is not dissimilar to the problem we see in patients with age-related macular degeneration. In age-related macular degeneration, the first layer we see that deteriorates is the middle layer, the RPE, and then the choroid, and then the neural retina. So with the later stage, because the choroid and the RPE have gone through this stress, those cells start to die, those layers start to break down, and then that top layer with the light sensitive cells starts to die as well. So regenerative medicine, a new paradigm, is trying to in some way rebuild those layers. Can we rebuild a blood supply at the back of the eye? Can we rebuild that middle layer? And can we rebuild that light sensitive top layer? And the answer is, that's what we're trying to do. And we've succeeded in doing that in the first stage of the London project. We've managed to do that in the middle layer. So we can reconstruct. When I say reconstruct, it's not just a case of putting things back. It's making sure the architecture is the same as well. And we can do that for the RPE. But with myopia, we need to be able to build a new blood supply at the back. We need to do that middle layer, the RPE, and we've done that. We've done that even in patients. And we also need to make light sensitive cells. So the rest of this talk tonight, while we're dealing with this in terms of age-related macular degeneration, it is totally usable as a therapeutic in which any of these layers are affected, which is what is the problem in myopia. These are the layers that are affected. So those um, parts, as in the blood supply, the RPE and the photoreceptors make up that crucial macular component. So can we actually start to really rebuild a macula? So blood supply, can we make a blood supply? And this is the second part of the London project. So in doing the blood supply, we need to make this choroid structure at the back. It's a structure which is, uh, in terms of its blood supply is huge because of the amount of work that's going on in terms of the eye. So to build a blood supply, we need the building blocks. And the first one is the lining of the vessels, of the blood vessels. And they're a specific cell, very different from the RPE, called the endothelial. We then need to make tubes, okay? So we need to be able to literally make a vessel. And then secondly, we need to make sure those vessels are open and allow blood to go down. And the good news, and letting you know tonight, <laughs> we can make the starting cells. So we can make those cells which line the blood vessels, the endothelial cell. Um, and in fact, um, to make them only takes six days, which is pretty staggering. But amazingly, we can get them to make a vessel. We can make them uh, or they can make networks of vessels. And what we've, all, what we've also shown, and what we, uh, when I say we, it's two very talented um, um, researchers at the Institute of Ophthalmology, they've managed also to make sure that these vessels allow fluid to go down them. And that's by putting in an aligning of cells as well as those blood vessels which allows blood to flow. Equally, those individuals have also been able to 
build the next stages of the whole macula. So we can bring together the middle layer, which is the RPE, and the blood vessels. So now we have two of the three components building towards a sandwich. And this is, I don't know whether this will play, but this is um, a car, well, it's an image. I'm just going to stop it. Whoops. Oh, no. Why did that? So I see whether I can stop it. Yes. So that red bit at the top is the RPE and the bright bluey bits are the vessels. And that's the architecture we need. We need the blood supply under the RPE. So now we have two of the three components to rebuild a macula. The question is, can we actually make the light sensitive cells? And this is probably one of the trickiest um, components, but the answer is yes. So we can now build um, a retina in a dish. We can make a light sensitive retina in a dish. And here on the left, we can make uh, photoreceptors or light sensitive cells, which are called rhodopsy. And they're the cells you use at night. And we can make two of the cones which are the cells in that central macular region, which is called LMopsin and S-opsin. So we now have a supply of that third component, which is the photoreceptors. So we are close to being able to seriously think of rebuilding a macula in those individuals in which there is this late stage disease in which both in myopia and also in age-related macular degeneration, where um, the blood supply is affected, the support cells, the RPE are affected, and there's also death of the photoreceptors. So the ability to try and replace all three layers. So to finalize what I wanted to say tonight, while my research has been focused on AMD, age-related macular degeneration. Those components are uh, usable equally for a treatment in um, myopia in terms of both the early stages of degeneration, which would be that blood supply and the support cells at the back of the eye because of the physics, uh, the, the mechanics, and um, due to the um, increased size in the eye. And then later on, the possibility of introducing light sensitive cells, again, produced from stem cells. Um, I think, yeah, uh, I'm gonna leave it there because I, I wanted to say that one of the big issues and um, I do know that one of the researchers is actually on this call as well, Amanda Carr, Dr. Amanda Carr. One of the big issues, which crazily doesn't seem to be the issue for age-related macular degeneration, is there's little funding going in to um, uh, myopic um, uh, macular degeneration, even though those numbers are huge. There's, at the moment, most of the attention in terms of the research is in suppressing the development of the myopia in obviously uh, uh, children, et cetera. Um, there's very little funding in terms of research, uh, either clinically or, uh, or else, um, uh, to actually target or even use some of the technologies and techniques we're using in AMD to transfer that over to myopia. So it would be great here to um, obviously help the Macular Society in terms of gaining some funding, whether it be from uh, interested uh, pharmaceutical companies or pushing um, uh, government. Um, Novartis have 
uh, made a very strong statement that they're wanting to actually invest in uh, myopia and in uh, definitely in the late stages of myopia uh, for, for uh, research. So there's a number of um, institutions and pharmaceutical uh, groups now which are getting very, very interested in myopia because of the unmet need uh, and the huge population, which is definitely um, gonna, gonna happen in these younger people coming through now with very, very um, large numbers of high, high myopics. We, we have so, to agree with you, Pete. We do, we, you know, it, it's as Geraldine said before, um, you know, the Magnet Society has, has always wanted to um, encourage people to fund research into, into myopic MD and uh, I, th I think the momentum is starting to build up, I think, which is, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, we might, we might be one away from anybody actually putting their hand in their pocket, but let's hope it goes in the right direction. Um, I, I, I did realise Amanda was on the course, so welcome Amanda. Uh, she did a, a very excellent uh, talk for us on, uh, on best disease. Uh, which has been viewed again several times on YouTube. So uh, as, as, as fantastic. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I'm sure we've got loads and loads of questions. Um, so I'm going to hand directly over to Heloise and she can uh, ask you some questions that have come in both from before the session. And I'm sure we've had some through the, uh, through the chat. Right. So Heloise, over to you. Thanks, Colin. Um, okay, so we've got some sort of slightly more technical questions and some more general ones. I'll start you off with a technical one, as you've just been talking us through so well, uh, that incredible process. Um, in the frame of MMD staging, Petra would like to know, so diffusion, patchy, geographic atrophy, at what point of the disease would the RPE patch that's being developed still work? At what point of the disease do photoreceptors actually die? Uh, great question. It's always... That is always the issue is when do you go in with any therapeutic? So um, the earlier you can go in um, with an assurance that you're not going to cause damage is obviously the major concern for, for any uh, surgical intervention. So um, ideally, if you if, for example, we didn't have uh, photoreceptors as part of the reconstruction, um, then you would definitely want to go in um, when you were seeing uh, the early signs of degeneration of the RPE, but that you were confident that the overlying uh, light sensitive cells were still there and still alive. Um, if uh, the light sensitive cells have died as well, then just putting RPE back is not going to um, result in any restoration of vision. Um, what, you, what needs to be sort of stated is a stem cell is not what we're putting into an eye. We're putting, we're using a stem cell to make the cells that are lost in the eye. Um, so they are turning into the cell which you're replacing. We're turning them in, sorry, into a cell that we're replacing prior to putting them back into a, an eye. It's, um, it's not commonly known, but stem cells don't know what they're meant to do. You can't just squirt a stem cell into an eye and expect it to replace RPE or replace photoreceptors. It wouldn't know how to do that. Um, but you can actually turn stem cells into the eyes which are lost through, through that disease. Um, but yes, if you, if you have only got RPE and the, the choroid, you want to go in before those light sensitive cells die. Thanks, Pete. Um, a couple of people have asked uh, about the shape of the myopic eyeball um, and whether the fact that it's you know, abnormally elongated would affect the success of any kind of surgical intervention and whether a patch, for example, would become damaged or degrade uh, more quickly because of that. So to what extent is the, the kind of structural problems of the eyeball uh, an issue for any kind of intervention of that nature? Yeah, no, it's a great question again. Um, the, the good thing in many ways is um, we'd be putting the patch in when the uh, growth of the eye is, uh, is stopped. So basically 
you're actually putting it into the system once it's finished growing. If we'd actually put it in while it was still growing, then yeah, you may still get some tension on the patch and therefore some you know, uh, stress on it. And if you're going in post uh, development, then uh, basically the patch is just gonna sit there in the position as the eye is, uh, and therefore shouldn't be um, um, susceptible to the same sort of stress uh, that was apparent during development. Thank you very much. Um, various people have submitted questions about um, dry MD and about what exists for that kind of atrophic damage and whether these types of therapy might be able to reverse that kind of damage and what kind of research is being conducted into dry as opposed to wet MD. I have quite a number of questions of that nature. Yeah, so if you're going into dry, dry is a very general definition. Um, and it depends at what stage of that disease you go in. So again, if you're going into geographic uh, atrophy, then typically there you, you have all three layers have been um, damaged and, and deaf. So uh, the light sensitive cells have died, the RP have died and the choroid has died. So you would need all three layers uh, as a treatment for that stage of the disease. Um, you can go in earlier before the light sensitive cells go. And that obviously would mean you wouldn't need um, the photoreceptors as well. So again, it's, it's, it's dependent at the stage of the disease when you actually um, uh, deliver the therapy. Um, again, the major issue there is you obviously don't want to go into the disease and make more damage. So you need to make sure that the surgical intervention, whatever stage you go in, is obviously appropriate for the stage of that um, uh, intervention in that disease. But um, again, going into late stage or end stage dry with just RPE will not actually benefit a person if they've lost vision and due to death of the overlying light sensitive cells, that would not be recovered just by giving RPE. Okay, thanks very much. And perhaps building on the back of that, Geraldine asks whether you're going to replace the Brooks membrane. Yeah, Brooks membrane was part of what we already do in the London project. So we have an artificial membrane, which we already put in patients with the RPE. So yes, we, we would be replacing the RPE Brooks membrane and uh, the next stage would be RP, Brooks membrane and choroid. And then the final stage, which is way complex, is, is the final stage is all three layers. So photoreceptors, RPE, Brooks membrane and choroid. Amazing. It's so uh, futuristic and exciting. Um, three people have asked about um, the other pathologies to which the myopic eye is subject and whether a person who also had, for example, glaucoma uh, who, or, or other complications related to pathological myopia might be suitable for these types of treatment. Um, yeah, again, it depends on the extent of that uh, pathology. Um, you know, the glaucoma, um, again, because of the just the physical uh, size and probably um, a closure of the angle uh, means that there is increased pressure in the eye. So there's uh, uh, a few things that can be done there to try and uh, help in terms of um, uh, reducing the pressure, but it shouldn't in any way um, negate uh, the ability to use, you know, the macular reconstruction, but you, you would want to try and uh, lower the pressures as well in some way, which could be done pharmacologically, possibly. Thank you very much. So we've had quite a lot of sort of technical questions, understandably, it's all exciting stuff. Um, uh, a slightly different question now, this has come in from three different people. Um, can you say something about the relationship between AMD and MMD? Um, so uh, does, does, can someone with MMD also get AMD? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the distinction between those two types of macular degeneration? Yeah, I mean, in its simplest um, definition, then um, um, myopic, my ma <laughs> myopic, myopic um, 
uh, macular degeneration is um, due to this oversize and um, mechanical stress. Um, whereas AMD is considered to be obviously a disease of age, which does have susceptibility due to you know, genetics um, and uh, may have you know, inflammatory age type components. So they're distinguished by the fact that myopia is definitely considered to be this um, over um, size of the eyeball as opposed to AMD, which is just considered to be age related and due to potential susceptibility. Um, can you actually get um, uh, AMD if you've got uh, um, MMD? Um, uh, in many ways, as I've just shown you, the, the, the similarities is almost identical in terms of the cell layers that are affected. So um, um, it doesn't really matter in terms of um, MMD in that the, the cell layers are still the same as AMD. I think in many ways, there's, that's why there's an opportunity here to consider the therapeutics that are being used for, for AMD to also be considered potentially useful for, for MMD. Thanks, Pete. Um, and just perhaps building off on the back of that, um, are there any plans, Petra asks, to include um, any MMD patients uh, in, a, in a trial, um, or are there plans to start a dedicated MMD trial, even a small one? So um, it's a great question. And there's been a couple of groups who, who have considered it, but again, it's because the funding towards um, myopia and, and definitely MMD um, hasn't been there to actually do these clinical trials. Um, even the London project has considered it, but um, clearly what we're trying to do is actually go through the regulatory process to get it approved for AMD. Um, um, so, I mean, it is a funding issue. Um, there are a number of groups that are using this regenerative medicine approach. Um, it does get um, suggested at a number of meetings and in a number of papers, but um, at the moment, um, there's no, as far as I know, there's no clinical trial heading towards this type of um, uh, use of regenerative medicine. There was, and I checked before coming on this call, there was um, possibly a trial happening in California, but um, that does not seem to be happening at the moment. Okay. Got a question for you about scar tissue. Um, is there a way to replace photoreceptors in an area of scar tissue? Um, patients with scar tissue, says Kimberly, are not often candidates for stem cell trials. Have you got any comments about that? Um, scar tissue can be removed. Um, again, the removal in the surgery itself can cause uh, certain complications, but um, at the moment, um, the trials for the use of a uh, stem cell derived light sensitive cell still are in their infancy. So um, it's not the case that they couldn't be used, um, but they're tending to go for very specific uh, groups um, with just photoreceptor degeneration, which is dissimilar to myopia, as I showed you, it's more more layers are affected due to that mechanical stress. So the first uh, light sensitive photoreceptor transplants are gonna go for diseases uh, commonly grouped together known as um, retinitis pigmentosa, RP. Okay, thank you. Two people have asked about the stem cells and where they come from. Uh, are they derived from the patient? How do you get them? So there are two sources that um, you can use. Uh, one is the embryonic source, um, which um, are produced from uh, donated um, uh, blastocysts. Um, and the second one is, as um, I, the question has highlighted, is this new technology. Well, it's not that new anymore, um, which is the induced pluripotent stem cells, which is you can take a sample of a person's skin or blood, 
and actually we we can do it with urine now we've done this with children and um, you can take uh, samples and um, make their own stem cells from those samples so from skin or blood or urine and um, uh, and then actually use that as the source of the stem cell and then turn those uh, what are called iPS cells into uh, the cell that's um, diseased and died in the patient. Um, it's very expensive. Um, it is very, it's personalized medicine to, to an exact because it's actually, you know, obviously using uh, the patient's own cells. It's then manufacturing them to uh, put them back into that said patient. Um, so at the moment, that's a very expensive route. Uh, there are ways in which groups are trying to uh, improve on that so that um, uh, one source of iPS cells could be used for a number of um, patients rather than it just being for an individual. Thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. Um, how long will it be? About three or four people have asked until this type of treatment is uh, available to somebody with MMD. What's the time frame? So the RPE one could be a matter, matter of a couple of years. Um, RPE and choroid um, will come after that um, and probably a couple of years after that. So we're already up to nearly five years. Um, photo receptors on their own um, is something which is being trialled and will be trialled over the next couple of years. Um, but again, um, that's something which then could quickly be um, um, brought into to this arena, as in myopia. So the area is fast moving as gene therapy was fast moving. Regenerative medicine, specifically in the eye now, is, is very very fast moving. So there will be a lot of trials reading out over the next um, two or three to five years, um, which will really give an indication of um, their potential and definitely their potential use for MMD. Okay, and as, as quite a specific question here. Um, will this treatment work for people with my uh, macular degeneration caused by PIC, and I'm going to try and remember what the acronym stands for. It's punctuate, punctuate inner choroid something, and you're yeah. going to help me out now. Yeah, no, it would. It would, yeah. So again, it's a consideration which we ourselves have had. So, you know, if we get it licensed for AMD, then it opens up the opportunity, like I say, not just for myopia, but there are other diseases of the RPE, which are specifically genetic, um, MERTI, K, LRAT, et cetera, um, and also PICS as well. So um, there are those possibilities, yeah. I'm just going to dive right. in here because I feel I have to. Okay, go ahead, um, Colin. Because, because next month's um, condition specific virtual clinic is on PIC. So whoever asked that question, uh, register, keep an eye out because we'll be opening up the registration for next month's session, uh, session on PIC uh, in the next week or so. Okay, thanks Colin. Um, what's our next question? Let's have a look. Uh, would, the, would stem cell treatment and the types of therapy you've been describing um, be appropriate for somebody with wet MD but who hasn't got atrophy? Yeah. So the answer, the answer to that is really easy because that's the first clinical group we went into with the RPE patch. So um, the answer is absolutely yes. Great. That's a nice, uh, straightforward, enthusiastic yes there. Lovely. Yep. Um, what else have we got? Um, so a question on a slightly different topic, um, but three people have asked it, which is about pregnancy and MMD. Um, there's obviously very little data on the use of anti-VEGF agents in pregnancy for people experiencing CNV. Um, do you have any comments to make about treating pregnant patients with wet M uh, MMD? Um, it's a very good question. I mean, the, the issue there is obviously the, the un unlike um, a systemic um, treatment, I mean, the, the anti-VEGF is actually given very locally, obviously, into the eye. Equally, um, 
um, it's also uh, a very small amount. Um, there are some, there, there has been about one study which has suggested, but it's really rare that the anti-VEGF can actually exit the eye, but it's in small quantities. Obviously it's an anti-vascular, so it is a concern within uh, pregnancy. Um, but at the moment, um, I mean, I'm not sure what the position is, for example, here in, in uh, Moorfields. Um, but um, I don't know of anything at the moment um, to suggest a major issue, although it would be something would, you'd need to you know, ask your clinician. Thanks very much. I'm sure that would be interesting and reassuring to, to the people who I know have that concern at the moment. Um, slightly different question now. Does your eye keep on growing? Does it ever stop? Um, somebody has asked. Um, it does. And that's that's the issue with myopia. So when you're if your eye keeps um, growing and goes hyper uh, or high myope, um, it does eventually stop. That's why I'm saying, um, you know, the big issue for us is not really the same concern in terms of the stresses on the patch, because once the eye is of a, a certain size, it's not going to keep on continually growing. The problem is, though, <clears throat> there are changes <coughs> in the actual refractive components of your eye, and they do keep changing over age. So, you know, round about, which happened to me, round about 45, you know, reading a newspaper became very difficult because suddenly um, I had the onset of presbyopia. So, um, you know, that's why I'm now wearing glasses. And so, you know, there is this issue about refractive uh, changes still occurring over age. Uh, but in terms of um, length and shape of the eye, that tends to um, be much more simpler in terms of um, uh, the length of development. Okay, thank you. Um, and a question from somebody whose central vision has already been adversely affected. Is there any chance that that vision can be restored by the types of treatment you've been discussing tonight? Well, that would be the goal. I mean, if, if the individual has obviously lost the central vision, it sounds like they've probably uh, in a position where those light sensitive cells in some way have been disrupted. So in that case, um, it would be uh, a need to go for some type of photoreceptor or light sensitive uh, therapeutic. Okay, how are we doing for time, Colin? I've got one or two more questions and then I think I'll have got through them all amazingly. It sounds good as in up at the hour. Okie dokie. Um, so the last pair of questions I've got for you are about um, funding and access. So can individuals or private sponsors assist with MMD trial funding? How much is needed? Um, and uh, you may not be able to answer that, the questioner realises. Um, and what about people from outside the UK? Might they be eligible for an MMD trial if there was one uh, in the UK? So um, typically with any trial, there's a very strict criteria for entry into that trial. Um, um, we obviously take a population which is within uh, London, um, but that is extended beyond London. Um, and uh, patients can be enrolled from anywhere within the UK. Um, Typically, it's only once those initial trials, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, have been completed, um, can those trials open up to other uh, groups and other individuals, specifically potentially outside um, uh, the UK. <coughs> How we do, we did have, because of the EU, obviously, uh, legislation which allowed patients to move within Europe. Uh, there is a bit of an issue whether that is still in place at the moment because of Brexit. Um, so we, we, we've just had one uh, concern just this week 
in, in whether we're allowed to actually include uh, European uh, patients. Um, but I think in terms of the question you asked previously, in terms of funding, um, there's still a fair bit of preclinical work has to be done if it's the case that photoreceptors and or choroid are going to be included in these therapeutics. So it's not just the case of funding preclinical or trials. <coughs> There's still uh, some um, science that still needs to be um, funded to get it to the stage where we feel confident and safe that the uh, therapeutic will have some impact. So, you know, if we look at the London project, <coughs> um, this will frighten people now in terms of the number. Um, if we look at the London project, just to get it to that first stage of clinical trial, that was nearly 10 million. So it's not cheap. A lot of money, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It, research costs a lot of money in it, uh, but it does have its, you know, its, it, its benefits and, and, and lots of people get the benefit from it. Um, I'm just very aware of time. so. I, I think um, I, I really, really thank you, Peter, for, for, for joining us this evening. It's, um, it's been great. I, I've, I've lots of people have learned an awful lot of stuff. I think there's a lot of excitement in the virtual room, so to speak. Um, it's, it's, uh, things are definitely progressing in the right direction. So thank you ever so much for your time. Uh, and, um, and I know you're a good friend to the Macular Society, so I'm sure you'll keep us updated with things that uh, uh, develop. Um, hello, Louise. Uh, th thank you for your uh, your time as well. Uh, you you did that a lot better than than I ever could. So uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Um, have you got? You're very welcome. Oh, brilliant. So um, so Jerry, have you got anything to add or, or anything to say or question or? Um, no, I just really to add to the the fact that we you know we we'd love to fund some research. We're reliant on um, at the moment on researchers submitting grant applications to us um, on myopic macular degeneration and um, we put out the message and I, I very much hope that we get some applications in and, and we can get start start funding some work in this area and, but uh, the researchers need to get on board with it as well absolutely absolutely so um the only least for for me to just to to thank pete again for for his time this evening so thank you very much that was so interesting um for for um anybody that um i don't know why i'm going to say if anybody that's not here this video will be recorded and said i was just blethering on so i'm going to shut up while i'm ahead uh and uh thank you for um and um and i and i hope you have a really nice evening as a well, last week's, next week's, uh, next month's uh, clinic is on uh, PIC. And I'm sending out some, um, some survey monkey evaluation, um, sort of things about this survey, uh, this, this session. So if you, if you want to fill that in and send me that back, that would be absolutely fantastic. Good evening uh, and thanks for coming and we shall catch you next time. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Colin. Thank you, everyone.